Uh, it's good to be with you this morning, and uh, it's nice to finally see fall, or you know whatever we call it, that used to be in between summer and winter. Uh, likes to last like a day these days, but uh, it's actually been better this year. I'm, I'm grateful for that. So uh, we uh, we uh, been studying through the Book of Ruth. We're continuing that today. Uh, a couple things I want to make mention of. Um, uh, is uh, this evening we have uh, if you are a member we've got uh, our member meeting tonight uh, going to be sharing some stuff that's going on and just kind of some direction of of uh, some things that I think are important for us to kind of take a few moments and and think about and pray about together as a, as a church and then uh, um, um, then we're eating chili uh, we've got a chili cook off uh, which is a little unfair because I made I made my chili so I'm going to beat everybody uh, so uh, all right. And uh, but uh, yeah, we uh, we'll have a good time tonight. Hope that you can come if you're a member. Uh, if you dare bring your chili, bring it. Uh, and um, if uh, if it doesn't taste good, we're going to shame you. Okay, so just just be ready. Be ready for that. So, uh, but uh, also uh, next week, next Saturday is big food truck. So I know Ben will talk about that. Which we'll make mention of it. Two two really important things going on. Uh, and uh, yeah, so good stuff. Uh, if you've got a Bible, go ahead and get it out. We're going to jump into the book of Ruth, uh, and we're in chapter 2 today. If you don't have a Bible, our ushers have Bibles, and they'd be glad to bring you one. Just throw your hand up. Let them know that you need one. If you don't own one, you can keep that one as a gift. We'd love for you uh, to have it. Uh, but uh, yeah, get uh, get one of those. And uh, we're going to talk today a little bit about Ruth. And um, you know, it's, it's funny, uh, one of the things that uh, uh, I get to do uh, on a weekly basis is name messages, uh, and so uh, you know normally it's uh, you know some obviously something to do with the message, uh, but sometimes it'll be like just you know the uh, you know uh, an excerpt you know or like something specific too you know maybe even just like straight from the scripture like a couple words or you know whatever and sometimes I'm thinking about like you know when people are uh, you know looking online and they see this list of messages and why they might listen to this one or listen to that one or whatever and uh, and today might be today might be my favorite title for a message yet and it is and, and all it is and not to just give it away but it literally is uh the very last verse of the of chapter two of ruth that we're reading today and the title is this and she lived with her mother-in-law and i thought you know, I shouldn't name it that. It's way too long. And then I thought, you know what? Just to mess with people for years to come who look at that list online and go, oh, I probably need that. You know, I mean, like, cause I, you know, let's face it. Like, that's, the, that's a line that, like, most of us go, oh, no. No, no, there's, there's a line, Lord. You know, we got we to gotta, we gotta draw it somewhere. But uh, anyway. Uh, it's, uh, that line is actually very telling of the message today uh, of, of what we see uh, in Ruth's life. Uh, if you haven't been with us, we've been talking through uh, this family. Uh, <laughs> we've been talking through this family. This hits a little closer to home for some of you, doesn't it? <laughs> so <laughs> you're not going to be able to get it back, are you? <laughs> it's, it's, it's way too much. Let's, let's, let's have a time of laying on of hands. Let's do, can we do that? Uh, but... Uh, <laughs> but uh i'm sorry uh but uh you know it's it's this this story of you know where, where we are now with these two ladies a mother-in-law and a daughter-in-law uh you know really started out with a husband and a wife 
and two sons that moved away to, uh, during a famine to uh, try to find food, to try to help take care of their family, a little bit of running from the Lord in there, probably there too, uh, you know, kind of thing, uh, taking matters into their own hands, so to speak, leaving God's people, blah, blah, blah. But anyway, we get to this point where uh, the husband died, both of the sons who also married uh, also die, leaving the three ladies, and then one of the daughters-in-law, she stays back in Moab where they had been living and Naomi, the mother-in-law and daughter-in-law Ruth make this move back to be with God's people. The famine is over. God is beginning to provide food again. Uh, And so they hear of this and they head back to be with God's people and be where they're supposed to be. And so, uh, you know, but there's this, there's kind of this little thing like Naomi, the, the, the mother-in-laws like, you know, you should stay, go be with your family, go find a husband you know, all these things. And Ruth, the daughter-in-law, is like, no, nah, I'm coming with you. We're going we're gonna to go through this together. And so uh, that's, that's kind of like this little bit of, you know, what we see. And, and we, see, we see Ruth just really strong. I mean, really, just to be honest with you, we don't, we don't, we don't have a ton of background on her. We don't know all the, you know, we don't know all these things about her, and like, you know, you know, what, what's her spiritual gifts, and what's she good at, and what's her favorite, you know, soda or whatever. I don't know, but anyway, you know, we, we don't, we don't know, we don't know any of these things. It doesn't matter. What we see is we see this woman who is just extremely faithful and strong with with following through with what she feels led to do, which is to stay with her mother-in-law and take care of her and go back with her and all these things, you know, and, and she just refuses to be defeated, you know? And, and I think there's something to be said for that because, uh, you know, I think for all of us, at some point in life, we have those moments where we feel defeated. We have those moments where like, you know, this, you know, I can't, I can't take any more, so to speak, you know? And, I'm sure for Ruth, I'm sure she had that moment somewhere in there. Her husband dies. She's left with nobody. And, and, and that, you know, in that day and age, this was a huge deal. I mean, it's a huge deal now, but in that day and age, like there was so much put on people and especially women unfairly, by the way, uh, so many things put on women as far as like what they were expected, you know, to do or their, what their, their value and like their value was in whether or not they had children and had sons and they were carrying on a name and, you know, all of these things to the point that, you know, literally, uh, you know, if you, your husband died and you know, the, he had a brother, then your brother was like obligated to marry you, to help continue to carry on the name, to help continue to take care of the kids, all these crazy things. And so here, you know, we've got this lady and she goes to be with her mother-in-law. And then when they get there, they find out that the harvest, you know, is in and it's time to reap the harvest, you know, just so happens, right? Uh, and she gets to work and we see her jumping in to going out in the fields and working and all this thing. And she runs across, you know, just so happens, you know, that she ends up in this field of a guy named Boaz. And we're going to learn a little more about him in just a little bit, but you know, she starts working. She is noticed for working. And, and really at this point, if you missed it last week, at this point, She's not working to like earn money. She's just working to try to get them some food. And the way this worked was that, uh, you know, people that had crops, people that had land, when they would have a crop, when they would have a harvest, they wouldn't, they wouldn't farm it all the way to the very edge. They would leave the edges and anything that fell to the ground while they were, while they were working was left on the ground. They were supposed to do this. Not everybody did it, uh, but this one particular landowner did. And it was for people in need. It was for the widows. It was for the poor. It was for people that needed uh, food to know that if they were willing to go work those little bits of stuff that was left behind, they could have food. And so that's what she's doing here. And so in the middle of this, we're catching this kind of in the middle of this because I I broke up the chapter into two pieces. Um, In the middle of this in chapter two, you know, we've already seen uh, that, you know, this guy named Boaz who owns the property is like taking notice of her and is like, hey, I, we, need to, we need to help care for this lady, you know? And, and this isn't normal, 
Okay, this isn't a normal thing. Uh, on top of the fact she's a foreigner, she's of a different race, uh, that wasn't, you know, widely appreciated and, and looked upon as to be a good thing uh, at that point in time. But nonetheless, she just keeps moving forward, recognizing that she needs God's grace, recognizing that she needs him to work. And, and instead of, you know, throwing the pity party, she's just like, I'm just, I'm just going to go for I'm just going to keep going. It's going to keep going and keep doing uh, what I think I'm supposed to be doing. Uh, and she's grateful and humble, and, and God just uses her in the midst of this situation and uses Boaz in the midst of the situation uh, to where we're picking up today in Ruth chapter 2, verse 14. Now, I want to read, read a little bit of this. Let's read this together. And it says this, Ruth 2, verse 14, and at mealtime, Boaz said to her, come here and eat some bread and dip your morsel in the wine. So she sat beside the reapers, his workers, and he passed to her roasted grain. This is like, you know, we brought some cooked stuff with us today. It's not straight out of the field, right? And she ate until she was satisfied and she had some left over. When she rose again, Boaz instructed his men saying, let her glean even among the sheaves and do not reproach her. And also pull out some from the bundles for her and leave it for her to glean and do not rebuke her. Okay, we're going to stop right there. We're, what we're seeing here is a picture of Boaz that's just really amazing, to be honest with you. I mean, he, he's going, to, to say he's going above and beyond, it really isn't even a very good description. I mean, like, he, he's going somewhere way above and beyond. Uh, and, and this whole, I mean, not only that, he's taking time to eat. He, first of all, he's taking time to eat with his workers. So I think that that's worth noting because that probably wasn't a normal thing uh, where, you know, the guy that, you know, owns the whole thing and is the boss man, you know, is taking time to have lunch in the middle of the day uh, with all of his folks that are working. This, this, is, not, this is not typical. And so he has, he's, he's eating with them, but then he invites her to come over. Now, if you remember, we just passed up uh, earlier in the chapter the whole bit about, you know, him, uh, Boaz telling Ruth, you know, hey, there's water over here that's already been drawn. You don't have to go draw your own water. Uh, you can just, you know, take the water that's already been drawn uh, by my men or whoever, you know, and, and even that was a huge deal because again, uh, you know, going historically, you know, all the crazy stuff that, uh, people did back then, uh, you know, you weren't, you know, the, the ladies were supposed to draw the water for the men and, you know, no woman was supposed to be getting water that was drawn by a man, but especially a foreigner, especially somebody of a different race. I mean, just all kinds of crazy messed up stuff, uh, you know, is what's going on. And, and, and Boaz just completely mowing through every bit of that. He's just like, don't care. I want to help take care of this lady. He, he heard about the story. He heard that, you know, here's this, this is the lady. This is the foreigner from Moab that is helping take care of her mother-in-law, Naomi, who lost her husband, lost both of her sons. You know, now they're both widows, you know, all this kind of stuff. And so he's like, you know, come here. And eat some bread and dip your morsel in the wine. He, he's like, you know, come on. He's, he's not just like saying, hey, we got some food left over here we're going to give you. He's like, no, I want you to come sit down with us. And I want you to try out my chippy dippy. Okay? You know, he's like, you know, this is, this is my chips and salsa and I want you to have some. It's really good. You know, kind of thing. Not, not just a passing in the, in the moment thing, but like, I want you to come sit with us, hang out with us, be with us. She sets beside the reapers, his workers, it says, uh, right there in verse 14. And he passed to her roasted grain. Roasted grain. Now to us, I mean, it, you know, it doesn't sound like much, you know, like, okay, some roasted grain. Well, that's, that's great, you know. Um, you know, I have this thing uh, about, about the ancient grains. You, you ever think about this? Like, the, like, like all these companies are like trying to sell us stuff where it's like, you know, here's this thing and it has ancient grains. And we, we got in this discussion in micro church one night where we got to talking about the ancient grains. I have no idea why. Well, I do because I brought it up because I'm stupid. But uh, anyway, I, and I was just like, I was just like, what the heck is up with the ancient grains? What makes them ancient? 
And nobody could answer my question. You know, and I was like, it's a ploy. They're not really that ancient. You know, I'm thinking if they are, they probably weren't, wouldn't be that good at this point. I don't know. But, you know, here, you know, we've got this moment where they're taking fresh grain. It's been roasted. This is, this is, you know, this is the cooked stuff. This is the prepared stuff. This isn't, you know, like we see Jesus, you know, walking through the field and he gets, gets in trouble with some of the church people or whatever because he, you know, pulled some grain out of the field and ate it on a, on a, on a Sabbath day, you know, kind of thing. You know, and they're like, oh, he's working, you know. Not, not what we're talking about here. Roasted grain, he's saying, have some of my lunch. Eat some with us that we prepared for us to have ahead of time. And it says, and she ate until she was satisfied, and she had some left over. And here we see the beginning of leftovers. Okay? (laughs) Hot chicken at 350 degrees for 20 minutes is perfect in the oven, okay? Just letting you know. Leftover. You're welcome. And it says, and, and literally, this is this really is like, I mean, it's a cool moment. Like he's he's saying, you know, we got plenty. Take some, take some with you. Take some with you. And in verse 15 it says, And when she, and when she rose to glean, Boaz instructed his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and do not reproach her, and also pull out some from the bundles for her to have uh, for her, and leave it for her to glean. And do not rebuke her. So now, I mean, again, way above and beyond. Way, way above and beyond. At this point, if I'm one of Boaz's workers, I'm like, I've been here for a while. This woman just showed up. You're giving her the keys to the kingdom. What's going on? What's so special about her? Why you got to, you know, I mean, you did, you know, maybe, I don't know. I'm just thinking. They're probably thinking this, but the Lord is using Boaz in this moment in time to help take care of her, to minister to her. And we, what we see is we see someone's character through these decisions that he's making. This, this man of God who's trusted so much in the Lord that when he sees someone in need, he's like, I want to help meet that need. I want to help minister to that person. I want to help love on this person right now. He's filling the role of a provider, of a protector. We see him literally in the passage before this saying to his guys, you guys don't don't touch her, don't get near her, don't mess with her, you help protect her. He's like, you stay, you know, with with my with my ladies, with my guys. They're going to take care of you. Don't go to another field where somebody might mess with you, all these things. You know, and, and here we just, we just see this beautiful situation of, of, of Boaz. And, and, and I know it's easy for us to go, oh, well, you know, it's not that big a deal. I mean, what is it? Just some grain and, you know, some of it roasted. Okay, great. You know, they put a little extra effort into that. Remember where we're coming from. Remember where we're coming from. And where are we coming from? We're coming from the days of the judges where men did what was right in their own eyes. The last verse of the book of Judges, right? Where men were doing what was right in their own eyes. Boaz is not a normal person in this moment in time in history and place in history and what's going on. This is something special that God is doing in him and through him. And furthermore, they're coming out of a famine. And what, you know, talking about like a 10 plus year famine, you know, that they've been in that we know of at least because that's how long, you know, Naomi and Elimelech and their whole family had moved to Moab. That's how long they'd been gone before they moved back. So we know it was at least that long. So what if you couldn't get anything to grow? Let's say you're a farmer and you couldn't get anything to grow for 10 plus years, and all of a sudden you have a crop, do you think that you're just going to be like willy-nilly like, hey, everybody, come on down here and get whatever you need. We just want everybody to have some. Oh, no. They'd be filling the tobacco barns full of that grain. 
and be like, let's, let's put this up. Let's buy some extra grain bins. Let's buy the good ones this year. You know, let's, you know, let's put this stuff away. We got to say that we may, we may be back in a famine next year. We don't know. He's over here like, hey, girl, you get whatever you want. You get whatever you want. We're going to protect you while you get it. The temptation to have wanted to hoard crops in that moment had to have been huge. And instead, we see Boaz here doing the work of ministry that we are called to as believers, doing the work of caring for the widow, the orphan, the stranger. And he uses his influence to help others who don't have any influence. What kind of influence has God given you? That's just a question worth asking every once in a while. And you may say, well, you know, I'm not really a, a leader, per se, of anything, or I'm not, you know, I don't really know, you know, I, before you jump the ship and say, you know, I don't, you know, I don't really have any influence, I, I, would, I would beg to differ that more than likely in your life you have influence in the lives of other people in, in probably many ways. And God has given you that influence as a gift that you might use it for his kingdom. Now you may think that you got it for other reasons, and maybe, and maybe there's some truth to some of that, but at the end of the day, the purpose of our lives is that we glorify God with, with everything that we have, with all of our life. We as influencers should be using our influence to push people towards Jesus and minister to people in need just as we see Boaz doing for Ruth here. Verse 17, it goes on, it says, So she gleaned in the field until evening. Then she beat out what she had gleaned, and it was an epith of barley. And this is you know, basically like a bushel, you know, it's it like a, a Hebrew uh, measurement. And it says, verse 18, And she took it up and went into the city, her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. She also brought out and gave her what food she had left over after being satisfied. So now she's brought home the leftovers, right? This is an important part of the leftovers. I don't know about your family, but our family has a distinct problem with when we finish a meal somewhere and we get the leftovers that oftentimes we leave the leftovers. You done this? Yeah. Not Ruth. Not after, not, not after 10 year famine. She's like, nope, taking these leftovers with me. She takes them home. She gives them to Naomi. And verse 19, and her mother-in-law said to her, where did you glean today? And where have you worked? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. She doesn't even let her answer her questions. Like she just, she's like, boom, 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 boom. Question, 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 question. She just sees like, here comes Ruth and she got food, right? And then, and then uh, she said, and it says, so she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, the man's name with whom I work today is Boaz. And Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, May he be blessed by the Lord whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. And Naomi said to her, the man is a close relative of ours, one of our redeemers. One of our redeemers. We're going to get to that. Verse 21, verse 21 says this, And Ruth the Moabite said, Besides, he said to me, You shall keep close to my young men until they have finished all my harvest. And Naomi said to Ruth, her, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that you go out with, the, with his young women, lest in another field you be assaulted. So she kept close to the young women of Boaz, gleaning until the end of the barley and wheat harvest. And she lived with her mother-in-law. There you go. So pretty, some pretty amazing things happening here. First of all, let's talk about Naomi. 
You remember Naomi, right? Naomi, mother-in-law, so tragically upset over everything that has happened to them that by the time that they get back, right, to see, you know, all the people that, you know, she knew, that she used to live nearby, her friends, her family, whatever, and they come to her and they're like, is it really you, Naomi? You remember what she did? She's like, nope, not, not Naomi anymore, Mara. Remember Mara? You know, she, she changes her name on them. And, 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 and why? Well, because Mara meant to be bitter. She was bitter. Naomi is a, a bitter woman at this point in time, which makes the whole and she lived with her mother-in-law thing extra special, right? It's true. It's true. It really, really hits with some of you guys, doesn't it? I can tell. And, and so, you know, what we have is we have this situation of, you know, we're reminded that, yes, what Ruth has been doing really is a, a great ministry and not probably an easy one. You know, she, first of all, she's been bitter. Bitter people aren't normally like super fun to hang out with. I don't know if you've noticed. Bitter mother-in-laws, I won't say anything else. And so what we have here is we have this moment where, you know, we get to, we get to peek in to this, this situation and we get to see Naomi's reaction to Ruth coming home first with the food and, and she's so excited. She realizes that, that her, you know, her time has been successful. You know, where did you glean today and where have you worked? Blessed be the man who took notice of you, you know, boom, 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 questions, you know, all this stuff. You know, and then, you know, Naomi, uh, Ruth answers and he tells her, about Bo, uh, tells her about Boaz. And then, you know, immediately Naomi launches into this extra thing. And, and it's this blessing, you know, where she's basically kind of praying for Boaz. You know, may he be blessed, verse 20, may he be blessed by the Lord whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. And Naomi said to her, the man is a close relative of ours, one of our redeemers. You know, and, and so we see, we see the moment where God turns her bitterness into thankfulness. He turns her bitterness into thankfulness. Are you bitter? Are you bitter about something in life that's just not really going exactly the way you want it to? It's easy to get there. Maybe you should pray and ask God to help you turn that bitterness into thankfulness. You have anything to be thankful for? Probably. <laughs> Probably. I, in fact, if I had to guess, if you're like me, and I, we all fall into these traps from time to time in life, we have more to be thankful for than we have to be bitter about, right? God wants to wants us to see that. He wants us to trust in him. He wants us to know he has our best interests in mind. And then we have, this, we have this moment here with Naomi where, yes, we see her bitterness turn into thankfulness, but then even further than that, we have this moment where she says, whose kindness hasn't forsaken the living or the dead whose kindness hasn't forsaken the living or the dead. And really what we have in that statement is something pretty special. It's something pretty special. She's saying the whole family. She's talking about the alive ones and the dead ones. And we're like, what? What? Yes. He's saying, she's saying the whole family. She's saying God hasn't, God hasn't turned his head away as we've been through all of these things as we as, as i've lost my husband as i've lost both of my sons as my other daughter-in-law maybe she was upset about that too i don't know maybe she secretly wished that her other daughter-in-law would have done what naomi did and stayed with her i don't know we don't see that 
But I mean, she's a person, right? She's a human being. She's a sinner like us. She has all kinds of feelings going all different ways. We know that she's been bitter. We know that she's been struggling. And, and then in the midst of this, then now she's saying of the Lord whose kindness hasn't forsaken the living or the dead. There's, there's been some kind of banner back and forth about is she talking about Boaz? Is she talking about the Lord in the midst of this? She is definitely talking about the Lord. Okay, and the Lord obviously is working through Boaz and we're grateful for him and his faithfulness in doing so. But at the end of the day, what she's saying is she's saying that the Lord has seen, the Lord knows, the Lord loves me, he cares about me, uh, you know, and she's thinking about her husband, Elimelech, she's thinking about her boys. And at the end of it all, she sees hope. She sees hope. And in some of those types of moments in life, it is hard to see hope right? It's hard to see hope. And so many people struggle with seeing hope. The glass is half full. Woe is me. And I, and, and I, I, I get to see it as a friend, as, an, as a pastor, as a dad, as, you know, whatever, you know, uh, all, all in all walks of life, people struggle to see hope. I, in my life at times, have struggled to see hope. We have all struggled at some point to see hope. And, and here, We're seeing God wanting us to trust him and that when he knows that we will trust him through the highs and the lows, that that's when we see scripturally many times then he provides the blessing. You know, and and, and look, it's not something that we reverse engineer and we're like, okay, well, I'm just going to, I'm just going to trust God and, and, you know, so that he will give me a blessing. That's not what scripture tells us. That's, that's like prosperity gospel or something. And that's, you know, for the birds, uh, you know, but you know, what we're seeing here is we're seeing this reminder of like, this is God working out something for his glory and through the faithfulness of people like Ruth and Boaz, and we just never know what's going to happen. We never know what God's plan is. We never know what he wants to do through certain situations. And here we have literally, because she brought leftovers, her bitterness has turned to thankfulness. Her heart has changed like that. And ours can too. He's reminding them that he's the one that provides. And it ain't all doom and gloom. And folks, I just, I encourage you to leave room in your heart, leave room for God to move. We're we're guilty, especially us as dudes, we're real guilty as guys to like, we just want to fix it. Let's just, we got to, what can we do to, to just fix it right now, right? We just want to fix it. And the truth is, is sometimes God doesn't want us to be able to fix it. He wants us to go through it so that we trust in him who can fix it. And, and, and in those moments where we're, There is that space where we just faithfully keep pushing forward, like what we see Ruth doing here, that we know that somewhere along the way, maybe God will fix it. We don't know. Maybe he won't. But either way, we know that he's got a plan, and it's it's what's best for us. He created us. He loves us. He cares for us. And if we're fixing everything, we don't need him. He's God. Let's let him fix some of this stuff. Let's let him have the glory for it. Let's tell the stories of the great things that he's done that he has fixed. It's so easy to be glass half full, woe is me. It's so easy. And and I just, I'm harping on it because I think for so many of us, sometimes we miss things that the Lord is doing because we want it to be so much about what we can do to fix it. And the truth is, is that he wants to move. He wants the glory. He wants to do something great. Yeah. And sometimes we've just got to be faithful. 
And just keep going. And just keep being faithful to the calling that he's given us. And there, listen, there'll be moments in your life when you're being faithful to the calling and you're like, Lord, I don't know where this is going. I can tell you, after 18 years of starting a church, there have been lots of moments where I was just like, Lord, I don't know. I don't know. I think maybe, maybe something else. Maybe something different. Maybe you need to... Maybe we need to change it up, you know? But I'll tell you what. Praise God for the moments where he has shown out. Moments where I have sat around in meetings with people and we, we talk about a huge need that's a part of the church. And, and then people would say, well, there's no way we can do that. We can't afford that. We can't. There's no, we'll never, you know? And you know what? And instead of just saying, and we've probably done both, to be honest with you, but instead of, in, at least in some of those moments, saying, well, you know what, we can't do it. Let's just don't even talk about it. Let's don't even breathe a word about it. You know, in some of those moments, we just said, hey, let's just, let's just tell everybody the need. Let's pray about it as a church. Let's see what God wants to do. Let's quit worrying about what we think we can do, and let's leave some room for him to work, and then watch him move. And he has moved and moved and moved and moved in this church's life. And I have seen him do that in the lives of so many families and in the life of our family. And he gets the glory for what we can't fix. And I'm liking this. We'll go. We'll get, we'll get, we'll get Jenna in here to play the organ here in a minute. Come on, talk to me. <laughs> Woo! Oh, man. There was a point in Naomi's life where all she could see was bitterness. In Ruth and in her life, all she could see was, I've got to be faithful. Naomi was blessed, I really believe this, really blessed out of Ruth's faithfulness. Did you realize that your faithfulness can bless the lives of others around you? You know that he's never left you, right? I'm sure Naomi felt that way. I'm going to guess. I think that's probably a fair guess. I'm going to guess that's probably some of the bitterness that was in her heart, <laughs> literally to the point I'm going to change my name to bitterness. You know, she's like, well, he left me. Well, I don't, you know, lost my husband, lost my sons, my family's gone, namesake won't go on, blah, 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 blah. And I'm sure she felt like that the Lord left her. And to that I say again, you know, he never never has left you. Never. And that's a massive statement for our lives today. It's a massive statement for our lives today. Here we have this picture of these widows in a vulnerable place in life, needing provision, needing protection, needing family. And I'm sure that in Naomi's back of her mind, she's thinking, you know, a husband and a child for Ruth would sure change things. And we kind of hang our hats on things like that. And the truth is, is what we see is we begin to, her, we begin to see her describing Boaz. And we see this glimmer of hope in Naomi when she says that he is one of our redeemers. Okay, now the Hebrew word is goel, okay? Uh, and I'm probably mispronouncing that. I was, I flunked Hebrew, by the way. Thank God for study Bibles and commentary and all this other stuff to people that are good for it. Praise the Lord for those folks. I lean heavily on them. The word goel that we see here in the passage as one of our redeemers is really the word translated kin's redeemer. 
It's a type of redeemer, okay? Uh, you know, and so this kin's redeemer is like a close relative who is able to come to the aid of a family member, and Boaz falls into this. He's a relative. He's a distant relative. Relative, he's not a brother. He's not an uncle. So he's not like you know an auto. He's not supposed to automatically marry Ruth because of the type of relative he is. Unlike if he was a brother, he would be supposed to automatically marry Ruth, uh, help take care of her, keep the namesake going, all those things. Um, but um, you know, Boaz. So so Boaz isn't like required to do this, but he falls into that he could. Be one of those people. So when so when Naomi is saying, you know, oh, he's he's one of our relatives, he's one of our redeemers, we're seeing hope in the words that she is saying. She knows what she's meaning here. But the truth is, at the same time, we also don't really have specific instructions in the Levitical law of, you know, how to address a situation like this for a person who had married a relative who had died and that that person that was still alive was a foreigner because that was actually not supposed to happen according to their law. And so the situation is a little messy for Ruth. But even despite that, Naomi shows hope. She shows hope. We see this situation where God uses Boaz to help care for Ruth and ended up caring for Naomi too in this moment, literally with leftovers, okay? To the point that God moves and shakes in Naomi's life, changes her heart in such a way. And, and it reminds me of a passage of Scripture. You remember Jesus feeding the 5,000? Well, you know, if you, if you go back and you look specifically, go look at the book of John, uh, chapter 6, you know, what you'll see is you'll see Jesus feeds the 5,000. If you remember, it's, you know, the boy's got the, the basket and we got the loaves, we got the few fish, you know, and, he, and Jesus turns it into all this food to feed all these people. And uh, I don't know when the last time was you were a part of getting to do something like giving tons of food away, like what we will be doing on Saturday, but people are usually pretty excited about that, you know? Uh, and in general, you know, I, I know a whole lot of us here today that like if you're giving like really good food away or you haven't eaten in a while and you're giving food away, you know, you'd be really excited about that. Well, you know, here, you know, in that particular situation, Jesus feeds all these people. Uh, and as a matter of fact, he feeds all the people. And then if you read through the passages after that, he then goes to walk on water. Okay. And, and then... He goes on to be with the disciples, and they get on a boat, and they go to the other side of the sea, and all these things kind of happen, you know, in an order, and um, the people come looking for Jesus. And really, when they're coming to look for Jesus, they're, they're, they're coming to look for the buffet, okay? Like, they're looking for Jesus because they know this guy feeds us, right? They're like, like uh, you know, I'm hungry again. Uh, let's see if that works in a second time. Let's go find that guy and see if he'll whip up some more fish and loaves for us, right? And so then we pick up John 6, verse 35, and it says this. It says, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall not thirst. This is his answer to them. This is his answer to those exact people who got some food during the 5,000 deal, and then now they're coming to Jesus like, hey, what's up? What's on? What's for dinner? And Jesus is like, hi, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me will never I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me, talking about the Father, and this, and this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. I'm sure they wondered what in the world does that mean. And then verse 40, for this is the will of my Father, in case you didn't know, 
that everyone who looks upon the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. And he's like, hey, glad you came for the ribs. Glad you're hungry for some fish. We were having a fish fry, and I, I see you guys are some of the folks that were part of the fish fry. Thank you for coming back. Let me tell you something. I am the bread of life, and whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall not never thirst. Everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Let me say this as clearly as I can. If you have never believed in Jesus as your Savior, it is the most important thing that you will ever do in your life. If you are teetering on whether or not to believe and you're trying to piece the puzzle together through your own mind or whatever, I'm just here to tell you, at some point, you have to, Scripture teaches we have to take a childlike faith and just believe and let God begin to help fill in the puzzle pieces. And by the way, you'll be filling in those pieces for the rest of your life. But it's amazing. And it's something you, you don't want to miss. And the truth is, is that everyone who believes in the Son will have eternal life and will live forever with Him in the last day. That whole Ken's Redeemer thing, that whole Ken's Redeemer thing, you know, where you, if you're a relative and you're, you're one of the relatives that has the ability to be a redeemer for the family, we didn't really get into talking about what they would do, but basically they had the ability not just to marry, okay, and continue on the family name, but they had the ability to, to buy back land and slaves and all this, you know, basically belongings and, you know, in, in a way for a family to buy back their life, to buy back their livelihood, you know, to buy, buy back the ability to continue to do something in this world. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 6.20, you were bought with a price, so glory, glorify God in your body. You were bought with a price. We, we were bought with a price. A ransom was paid on our behalf when Jesus went to that cross and gave his life and shed his blood. And three days later, the tomb was empty because he defeated death on our behalf that in death for us, we have life because of the work that Jesus has done. Our need for a Redeemer is real. Our need for a Redeemer is real. Don't let that slip by you today. We need Jesus. We see Naomi's faithfulness. It stuck out. She believed. She believed that the Lord had a plan. And she got to see him turn bitterness into rejoicing all because she lived with her mother-in-law let's pray God thank you thank you for the cross thank you Lord that we have a redeemer who is greater than a man greater than someone that can just help us, but, Lord, saves us. God, thank you for sending your Son to die on the cross. Thank you for an empty tomb. God, in the moments ahead in our service today, I know that we will focus on that. God, I pray, Lord, that as we do, Lord, I pray that you would just continue to remind us, speak to our hearts, Lord, show us how good you really are. God, I pray that you would be glorified in us in every way possible. Lord, I pray for anyone right now that has never trusted in you to be their Savior. God, I pray that today that they would believe. God, I pray, Lord, that you would impress it upon their heart, Lord, to speak to someone today before they leave. 
God, thank you for this work. Thank you for the reminder today that you never leave us, that you have a plan, that you will provide. God, that you want to use us, that you want to use our faithfulness to change lives. God, I pray, Lord, that you would do that, but not for our glory. I pray that you would do it for yours. God, thank you for the reminder that you are the bread of life. God, thank you for the chance that we have to be a part of your family. We ask all this today in your name, your son's name. Amen. If you're here and you would like to talk to someone about knowing Jesus as your Savior, I'm going to go to the foyer right now. I would love to speak and pray with you.